Does that mean we've started? Uh, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to Alice Yard's first live conversation in um, Documenta 15. Um, thanks to all involved. Um, we're having a how we, um, define this conversation. Um, it's part of an ongoing conversation that started, I suppose, between myself and Richard Fang many, many years ago. I, I kind of often, I often date that conversation with the age of my youngest son. So I won't let go of his age. <laughs> what we feel is age. And that's around the time we met, um, just before or after um, he was born. And, um, sorry? Oh, I missed something. Um, and um, so thanks to um, Rand Grouper, Documenta, um, and this conversation, which has been ongoing about various things. Um, it's kind of, we are here in Port of Spain, which is um, in Castle. Uh, and we are talking about a couple of things, primarily uh, Richard's latest project and other meandering topics that we will arrive at. So I, I, I in terms of introducing Richard, I, I, I mean, I, there was a lot of information on the blog side. Um, so I, I don't think I wanna just repeat that. Um, you can go to the blog side if you wanna see it. Um, and I think I'll let Richard jump in. I think he wants to start off by sharing something with us. And um, we'll see how we go from there. Yes, I think in fact we'll have a meandering conversation, which will at times touch on my latest project. Um, but yeah, just to, I had a topic in 2002 or three um, to actually research the gay movement in Trinidad and Tobago in this period. Um, and then I got there, the movement was a little bit uh, fractious. And in the meantime, uh, Gabriel Hezekiah, Chris, I remember driving up one evening into the St. Anne's Valley to, to meet Chris. And then we started chatting, and the chatting happened. It's happened in Toronto, it's, happened in Arthur, it's now happening in Castle Trinidad. Um, and um, I want to start with, with this project. This is my project. So I ended up making a couple of things, including Ireland. I think we'll show a documentary this, Nicholas, this summer. I ended up making a talk conversation no. with, and, um, and made a video called A Big Ball, The Art of Christopher Cozier, which came out and was started doing a bit. I think it was a that Alex was interested in. Um, and what seems to have a transnational conversation like this in, in Germany and in, in the Caribbean. They're going to do the clip now, right? Yeah. Globalization is something that the Caribbean was born into, the very inception of it in terms of European nations having these external industrial sites. The Caribbean is a site where people come and go all the time. And Trinidad in particular, in the context of global conversations, is a crossroads, is a kind of boom town. Island 
is a place from which people look out. Boats on the horizon mean other worlds. You know, my earliest memory of, of, of growing up in the Caribbean was watching the edges of the island and knowing that there was a world out there. Oh my God. I just saw another self there with hair. <laughs> well, um, it's interesting um, that I didn't mention actually that I had heard of Richard's work um, sort of towards the end, you know, before I came back to Trinidad trying to keep up with things internationally. And I never put the two together. I think I did a, a, a kind of strange um, seminar with Douglas Cripp or something like in 1988. And uh, before I graduated from graduate school and some reference was made to Richard's work or something Richard had said or done, um, which was that, you know, so that, but I didn't put the Richard farm um, I didn't even realize that Richard was Trinidadian um, at the time, because I think it was mentioned, you know, within the context of conversations going on in the U.S. and Canada. But uh, I think there's something interesting about that, uh, you know, uh, this kind of sense of how people like ourselves navigate space, uh, just falling on from the idea of looking out, you know? Yeah. Are we hearing each other? Um, I'm, are you hearing me, Chris? Yes, no. Okay. So this is a, this is represents the state of technology. Imagine Marconi. <laughs> I am struggling. Um, should I maybe turn up the speakers? I, I don't. Is it that you all are having an unstable <laughs> connection? You. And you? you are hearing me, right? Yeah. Okay, because on you your side, you can. I'm hearing you in, like intermittently, like I'm catching every other word. So that, that's why I'm freezing. I'm trying to follow. Well, maybe we can just start okay. by um, about the um, the clip, like what um, I, I don't know what were you trying to. Well, I, I suppose you're underscoring the sense of of um, looking out. Um, well, yes. I mean, one of the things that interested me in that clip is that, you know, there is this sense of insular, right, that, that um, people think of as islands, but also growing up in, in Trinidad, so aware of the outside world, just as you say, in fact, islands are not very insular. People are actually really curious about the outside world. And when I was growing up, people were always reading the newspapers. Right, that was the thing. It was like, you know, I was a kid when television came in. And people would watch the test pattern on TTT. Um, mm -hmm. And everybody was getting, you know, like we had a, a, a TV with four legs and a doily on top and a little vase with plastic flowers on top of it. Um, and I think that was the case in many people's homes. But it is this sense of really being connected to the world. And something else that you mentioned that I think is really significant is that there is this sense of cosmopolitanism in the sense of people who travel, you know, like on um, cruise ships and things. But there's another kind of on the ground cosmopolitanism that Trinidadians and other Caribbean people have often been engaged with either going to like Maracaibo or, or Panama or going to New York or to London to work. And the way that people also have circulated within the territory um, so there is also a history of movement in that 
globalization, that formative globalization that you talk about. And that globalization is a violent globalization. It's a, it's a globalization that starts with indigenous genocide and involves African it's the enslavement of African indentureship, etc. So there's a way in which um, that history and engaging with that history, I think, is a sort of starting point for work coming out of the region. Um, and so that, that kind of interests me as somebody who is now living in Canada, where finally government institutions are dealing often clumsily, often in very contradictory ways with its own history of genocide and, um, and its own history of slavery as well, because you know, Canada celebrates itself as a nation, as the site of the Underground Railroad, but there was also an African and Indigenous people in, in Canada as well. And there are, um, you know, I, I think of a poor Cooper who is a, a Jamaican Canadian historian who's really been doing that, Camille Turner, who um, is a Jamaican uh, contemporary artist and scholar. She just got a PhD. Um, it's also, also been really interesting tour brought to where she actually brings out that history by, by moving to the physical space. Mm -hmm. So I think kind of these different kinds of strands, but also because I think that the doctor touch on the controversy um, uh, Israel and Palestine because the way in which I've been engaged in solidarity as well and coming from a Caribbean context we have kind of a different perspective on that issue that has been and strikes me about the German general or the dominant conversation Eurocentric should respond to the situation as there's the historical burden of this one. And I think that, that coming to a multi centered way of approaching, as I think, Richard is freezing again. Richard, you froze on you. Hmm. I missed um, the last part of Richard's thing, but you were talking about Palestine, the Palestinian um, issue. Oh, Lord. Um, is it that Richard is the one that's being shut off? Is he still? Yeah, just ask. I mean, uh, all right. So what should I do? I'm waiting to. Yeah, I, I think we're sorting out a technical challenge. I think the connection in Castle, ironically, is unstable. <laughs> okay. um, so we're waiting to see how to settle the problem on Richard's end. Um, I'll give it a minute. Um, so just bear with us. Can you hear me now? I think it sounds like you're back. I was trying to follow you were making, you were talking about your interest in, um, you know, I suppose with the project you did in Ramallah, your interest in Palestine as a follow on from the concept of global, you know, global, a global point of view coming from the Caribbean. And, um, so if you can clarify that point, because I lost track of you towards the end, you were breaking up. Well, uh, just in, in brief, can you hear me? Now, now you yes, can, right. you can hear me. Can you hear me? Sure. So, one of the things that strikes me, for example, in the way that the issue of Palestine and Israel is being talked about within Germany is that it's so much framed only allowed by the German history of anti Semitism. And um, 
and and it then because of that burden and that framing around the guilt and the need for addressing that history and of course you know there are neo nazis organizing in germany today so it's not a history only of the past um is that it does not take into account different claims different sufferings but it only allows one narrative and i think that that is what bothers me because on the one hand you've got uh, you know the um, boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement being outlawed here. At the same time, you have Amnesty International, uh, Human Rights Watch joining uh, it's Salem, the Israeli Human Rights Group, and before long before them, the South African Human um, what is it called the uh, Human Social Human Sciences Research Council in South Africa coming to the conclusion, along with people like Desmond Tutu. I'm um, saying that Israel is an apartheid state, right? So you got that one thing. And so how does one re respond re respond to a state that many, that the most credible human rights organizations describe as an apartheid situation? On the other hand, it's outlawed to critique this apartheid system, right? So it's a, to me, as somebody who who is in some ways in the sense of this particular history, it, 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 it boggles the mind. And I say in some ways, because, you know, in 1990, I made the first film that addresses the Caribbean, that addresses Trinidad and Tobago. It was called My Mother's Place, and it was looking at consciousness about race and gender in between me and my mother. My mother born in 1909 in Maruga, very much in the colonial <laughs> mindset, and me coming just after independence, completely different orientations to the world. And when I included an anecdote in that in which my mother talks about Jewish refugees coming from Germany to Trinidad, right? Um, and her expressing her, her empathy or her sympathy with the suffering of this group of people that she had no idea. And I included her talking about, she said, Jews, we didn't know about Jews, you know, they used to, they used to come and sell cloth. Of course, what she's doing is collapsing the Ashkenazi Jews and the Syrian Lebanese population. She just saw them as a kind of other, as opposed to the, to the, to the, to the populations known in Trinidad. She also said in that same sentence, you know, we, we didn't have Asians, Koreans, Japanese, they were all like, we just knew that we were, we were Chinese. So, the, so there's a way in which there's a certain kind of illiteracy around ethnicity, etc. But also because of that, in a way, um, a sort of openness to, to understanding the world from the that, that that connection of knowing about the world, but also um, not being implicated in this has given certainly me, a, a different kind of orientation to thinking about um, Israel-Palestine. And I don't think it's just me. I think the rest of the world, other than certain European countries, the United States and its rights, um, you know, are very much aware of the injustice that's going on there. When I talk to you know, people who are not, again, invested with a particular history, it's, um, uh, it, it's clear that, that there are, there are um, it's a complex situation that requires a, a, a complex and just solution um, that is just towards uh, Jews and towards Palestinians. Yeah. But it's a weird kind of, um, it's, it's deeply ironic in the sense that, you know, when you come from a society like the Caribbean with a long history of colonialism, of conquest colonialism, slavery, indentureship, and so on, you know, we talked about it, you know, these industrial, ex-industrial labor camps and so on. Um, but, I mean, we are kind of like the rehearsal spaces for these kinds of dastardly things that happened um, much later on. And, and so in a way, it's in our DNA to have a kind of sensitivity to these things and to have a tremendous empathy for other groups um, that have suffered over history and within particular extreme historical um, moments. So in a way, there's, a, there's, a, there's empathy and then there's a kind of a, an indifference. And, um, and the indifference comes at that point where you're confronting with the, uh, a kind of 
local power that transmits itself outwards through the power of media and resources that then turns around and silences you and, or, or tries to say to you that they have a better wisdom around this thing, but they haven't taken any responsibility for their own local. Uh, and I think there's a kind of a weird irony in that, especially in the context of documenta, because um, the paradigm shift of this documenta was to engage a wider um, global conversation. Um, so it's not seated within a singular narrative. It's a kind of pluriversal. So there will be some slippages and there will be some zones of um, misunderstanding or, or, or misreadings. Um, and I'm not covering for whatever is going on. I'm just saying that I actually wanted to know more about what this, for example, with the mural incident, I wanted to know more about the history of this mural and the artists and what was on their mind when they generated that image. Like what was going on? What was going on in the world? What event had just happened? Like why, why such a bizarre representation? And uh, um, I understand it in the wider sense of the, the history of the political situation within Indonesia, but, I, but very often works sit within a given time. You know, so um, while we are willing to acknowledge the, that, for example, when we look at European art, you know, um, coming from the colonial era, there's so many questions, you know, what sus we suspend our knowledge to understand something and we say that's, that's because a person is, this, this is, event is happening within this time and those were the prevailing values, so we have to make some kind of allowance even though we don't agree with them. But, I, but nothing of the nature had come up around this work because this is a historical work. Um, so you know, I thought the first question is, what the hell was this guy thinking back then and why? And what does it mean for the issue? And, 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 but I don't know, I don't know enough. And I didn't have the privilege of even finding out. It was just cut off, right? And that I find is kind of um, as troubling as what they are troubled about. Um, because in a sense, the, what, the, the notion of liberal democracy, which is being sold to us, um, or was being sold to us, was supposed, you know, under the auspices of a, of a kind of universal um, standard, which we know, of course, you know, it's, um, isn't quite as open as it appears to be, but for expedient local reasons, because of a local history um, that isn't seen itself as a local history either local to Germany, but maybe local to Europe, because I mean, even though Germans might have carried on this practice, you know, this process, they were certainly doing it in complicity with most of the countries around them. Um, so it, it's a very, very complicated um, um, moment um, because it's asking me to do something that um, as a person coming from another place, um, you know, balancing my empathy and my, you know, interest um that how do i um how do i make an informed or meaningful um kind of response to these issues in this particular platform at this time so i i kind of wonder there's I mean, a kind I mean, of weird power yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> well i think you're absolutely right i mean there's a way in which there's a silencing happening in the name of freedom of speech Right, like the West is supposed sees itself as the beacon of freedom, and in doing that, they're also silencing. They're silencing and tapping down the conversation. The thing, you know, like I've always been critical of people who say, you know, everybody's a Nazi. There's Nazis, there's Nazis. But there is a way being in Germany and being aware of the trajectory from Weimar to the rise of the Nazis to, you know, Hitler, that it seems so much like a replay of what is going on. I've, um, Tim just told me that the, the Supreme Court of the United States has officially yes. you know, overturned Roe versus Wade. Um, Today. So that abortion is no longer a constitutional right for women in the United States. Um, we're seeing all of this kind of stuff. You know, in the, the French government is fighting with the people of, where is it? Um, one of the cities in southern France which wants to make it okay for women to wear burkinis to go to swimming pools. And the government, the central government of France wants to, to maintain a ban. So they basically, what they, what they want to do is to erase a whole part of their population 
And you know, there's there's a the Jamaican, um, my former colleague and friend, Lillian Allen, had a line in one of her poems uh, that people follow prophets, right? Like, why are there so many Jamaicans in Canada? It's because they follow the prophets of the extraction of wealth from the Caribbean. Why are there all these Moroccans and Algerians and Tunisians in France? It's because of French colonialism and they extracted the prophets and people followed those prophets. It's exactly the same situation. And what they're trying to do is to erase that population, also in a sense, erase their history. Um, the French have not been good at uh, confronting. Yeah, and they're having this conversation, and I'm suddenly becoming very aware of my orange t shirt, which looks saffron. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Oh my God, it looks saffron on the screen. I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, maybe this conversation is going to become outrageous. Um, but um, yeah, it, it, I think. Can you still imagine your, your, um, your performance? So, yeah. He looks like an Indian. I yeah, yeah. That's that's a, a, no, I hope you won't think you're a movie supporter. Sorry? No, I, so, I Chris, think, I know um, you wanted to. Um, um, uh -oh. Talk about <laughs> Ladu. <laughs> well, actually, what one of my things that I'm really interested in, because I'm glad you brought up this thing about looking up, is um, in a lot of my thinking, I'm coming to terms of things that are happening in my own practice and the practice of other colleagues. And I've been thinking a lot about the geography of production, um, where, you know, all of us, even though we are um, defined as coming from one place or described as residing in another, um, our thought processes and our practices are kind of moving across a geography. Um, and, um, and in some ways, um, it, it has pr created a problem because inherent in the, the constructions that form curatorial interests or representational kind of politics, there's a, there's a pressure to place us, you know, um, in a kind of singularity. You know, a kind of singularity is a kind of, especially at the juncture of exchange, right? And, and um, so what has kind of interested me Years ago, when you we were having that conversation from here, you know, in in the U.S., someone expressed alarm. You know, but you're from the Caribbean. Why are you doing something about Ramallah? Oh my God. Are you all hearing that? There's somebody revving a car. Yeah, it's a, it's a sound of a castle. It's but nice. It's, it's not. Yeah, but it's not interfering with my. You're not. You're hearing me, right? Because it's very loud to me. Um, so I'm kind of interested in, in that a lot of the work, you know, yes, you reach back to home, but you reach to other places. And, um, and Ladu is one of those interesting um, characters, you want to say Trinidadian or Caribbean, that's also involved in a kind of a journey. Um, um, so I was kind of fascinated by that. Like, how did you gravitate to him? I understand what... When we were speaking the other day about people like Jamali Hassan describing what he meant to young brown people in a, at a certain moment in the history of cultural production and uh, as a reference point in Canada. Um, because in Trinidad, I don't think he was that well known until maybe like in the early 90s. I mean, maybe specialist in literature or something might have known. But as a, as a regular person growing up, not you know strongly connected to literary things, but reading, I, I, I really didn't get wind of him as a writer until the early 90s. Not a lot of people had heard of Ladu. I think he's coming back and I think his moment has come. So, you know, for people who are just looking at this, um, I have a new project and it's a documentary on the author of Sonny Ladu. He came to, to Canada in the late 60s. Um, by chance, became a writer. He was working as a short order cook, and he um, he published his first novel in 1973, and then went back to Trinidad and was murdered. And his second novel, Yesterday's, was published the year after. 
his story is interesting to me because, I mean, it's, it's so full. But first of all, I can't remember exactly when I came across Ladu's work, but it was relatively early. And what drew me to Ladu was the rhythm of his writing. I mean, it's the writing that is incredible. In No Pain Like This Body, it's like a prose poem. They're both like less than 100 pages. But in that one, it's completely abject. It's like beyond positive images. It's like this nasty patriarch. It's a rainy season that never ends. It's like scorpions, you know, like being rushed down to the, to the rice fields. Um, and then No Pain, Yesterday's, is the queerest book, uh, one of the queerest books I think I've ever read. Uh, as Anna Gosain said, read. if you take a theme, you lose to a third of the book. And it had this line in it that stuck with me because you know it's set in a little village in central Trinidad and um, all the married men, all the husbands are having sex with this <laughs> one character who's described as the village wow. queer. Yeah, and at one point, the village queer is going to, to Spanish town. That's how Port of Spain is referred to, for some kind of assignation yeah. with somebody. And the two other husbands are talking about him. And they say, one says, you know, he's going off to, to meet somebody. And the other one says, you mean white people just do that too? And that flip, right? Um, because I was having arguments with like, particularly one with, I remember Lenny Johnson, who was the older, owner of Thoreau Books at that time, whose position, he was an African-American actually, he was not from the Caribbean, but um, with homosexuality was introduced into the Caribbean by white people, by Europeans. So the fact that, that Ladu in 73, because <laughs> was inverting, was flipping that, it was kind of an amazing thing. Um, and I was actually just in conversation with people at Penguin Random House and really suggesting that they bring that book out now because I think it's out of print. It's impossible to get. Um, and I yeah. think its moment has come. It, so Ladu is one of the people that I think um, is so interesting because he's a writer's writer. Like Kevin Hussein, who lives in Trinidad, claims Ladu as one of major influence. You know, David Chariandi wrote the... Um, the uh, introduction to the last edition, Monique Rofi is doing the new one, Dion Brand, who is his classmate at the University of Toronto, wrote the first introduction. So there's a way that he, he, he he's a writer's writer. Um, mm -hmm. But the reason I got into doing this film is by chance, is because Christopher Laird of Banyan uh, had been making a project, coming to Toronto every few years at, at C. Christopher, and he was shooting somebody else. Um, and then I wrote to Christopher, I think it was last year, and said, Christopher, what about your doc? What about your TV series? And he said that he'd abandon it. So now I'm making, using Christopher's 20 year old footage and making a film that's also partly about Christopher's own obsession as, a, as the primary documentary filmmaker in Trinidad with Ladu. So it's like a double portrait of cultural production, the writer and the yeah. filmmaker. No, but you know my story, right? I mean, I, I had this weird experience where I think Tony Hall and Christopher, I'm trying to remember this, who the third person was. It, I mean, it was so long ago. And, you know, we jumped in the car, we drove down. It wasn't to Bush Bush. Huh? It I know it was Tony Hall, I know it was Christopher. I don't, I don't know, I don't think it was Errol Sitahal. I, I can't remember, unless it was just us, I can't remember. But all I know is we, we got down there and they were running they were running up and down in the hills and saying this we go shoot this here, we go shoot that here. And I just stood there and, and you know, because they wanted me along, they had some idea that you know I could be a creative participant. And and you know, they were these are two sort of esteemed people that have had an influence on my life at various stages and ongoing, you know, Tony and Christopher. And I saw a side of them that I <laughs> Just to, and not see, because they were like children running up and down, you know. And, but, but it was also kind of part of that Caribbean dream of a certain generation too. So it, it felt, it was beautiful, it was playful, but it also had a sense of tragedy, you know. Um, and I actually wish that I had, because I had a small camera at the time, and for some reason I didn't carry it, because I felt that would have been a really special moment just to capture them in this kind of moment of, well, you know, whimsy, fancy, you know, and um, 
And um, yeah, but it, it stayed with me. So it's kind of interesting that you have kind of come to that, um, you know, to kind of join in that process now to make this film about Christopher's interest in, because I actually thought the, the, that was the story. That's what I was feeling at the time, that the story was their desire to make this film more so than the film itself, which seemed within the conditions of life in Trinidad and it seemed like almost like an impossible dream, but the idea to make the film seemed to be the, the story. And, uh, and that's what I walked away from that moment with. So I'm kind of, it excited me when I heard that you were doing this because um, it's another so kind that, of idea. That was Christopher's first attempt deal with Ladu. He yeah. had gotten money, I think from Channel 4 or BBC or something to write a script for a feature film version like this story. Um, and then that was put aside and then he decided to do the TV series on, on yeah. Ladu. So hopefully finally Christopher's engagement as a filmmaker with Ladu will finally he itself come to life <laughs> through me, ironically. That's but I, I'm also That's hoping really to go to Paddy's Mirror where they were um, doing the location scouts. So I want to take Christopher back to that site. Mm -hmm. He was he was planning to shoot. Of course, because yeah. because No Pain Like This Body is set in 1905, I think. And mm. Central is completely different now. Like it's all built yeah. up. Um, but I don't think I've been back to that. Yeah, I don't think I've been back to that part of that. I don't think I've ever been back there since I, uh, maybe one or two other times, but the time with Christopher and Tony was, I think, the last time I was there. And I think that's over, I want to say that's 20 something years ago. That's a long time ago. It was sometime in the late 90s, I yeah. believe. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, something really fascinating, you know, about um, this idea. I mean, I remember, I mean, that book yesterday has some, <laughs> you're right, it does have some pretty, um, I mean, I, I, one of the things I remember was the, the, the guy's fascination with the sewing machine and then expressing a kind of a, if, I hope I remember it right, but he was so impressed with the sewing machine that he'd gotten for the tailor, but then was so confused that these people actually had toilets inside their house, you know, and he couldn't unuse toilet paper, you know, this kind of connection between science and a, a way of living, and I suppose, and then this weird thing about the guy, you know, getting, I think some weird thing about Han, was it Hanuman stepped on his testicles and they were swollen. I mean, it was just completely irre irreverent, you know, and the, I, and the two men would meet when the guy was sneaking to use the other one's bathroom at night and they would have these conversations through the window. It, it was a very bizarre, um, you know, some of the stories in yesteryear were just completely outrageous, you know. Um, it's a, it's a yeah, different. I, mean, I um, remember thinking of your orange. Sorry, thinking of your orange. They, they, they hold, the plot is that the son, who had been abused at Canadian missionary schools, Presbyterian missionary schools, <laughs> wants to go to Canada to convert Canadians to Hinduism. Yeah, as a kind of revenge for for the abuse that he. Missionaries in Trinidad. Um, yeah, ready. We are here in documentary. I am looking at your Pira, your new updated Pira, which for those of you who are in the room is that bench in front here that Sean is sitting on. But this is a new version of it. Uh, you've done um, uh, many drawings in the past. And now you Some of those drawings are done by Christopher Chen. Um, the original drawing I had done, sketch of a real bench on Benares Street in St. James that I've been watching for years. Um, I mean, there were many benches there, but I'm not exactly <laughs> sure when that bench particular design came about. But I, I think I've been thinking a lot about idling. Um, I suppose with civil servants, parents from Barbados growing up in a place like Trinidad, the concept of being an idler, the concept of being occupied, 
um, you know, all those words and terminologies. And what blew my mind when I saw that Lima's bench is that one side of the bench had the base of like the officer, the manager chair, you know, the, the swiveling chair, which is associated with managerial largesse kind of in, in the context of the Caribbean. And then the other side is the kind of work bench side. And so uh, when I saw that, I kind of said to myself, this is a kind of a symbolic object dedicated to um, sort of idling, you know, which is a way of living that's off plantation between factories. And, um, and I've been thinking a lot about the imagination and in the context of the Caribbean, places like the Caribbean, and thinking about it in the context of, um, well, the whole experiment we've been we've embarked upon in in an at Alvesiad, you know, which is seen as a waste of time, you know, because we are not hustling, you know, because and Nicholas always says Trinidad is a very shrewd place, um, and um, and when people talk about development, you know, they, they talk about just getting more serious about investment, but actually no, that's where we started, and what we what we are actually not developed is a sense of human value, a sense of our own value, and a sense of the value of the human imagination. Um, you know, and, and these kinds of off factory, off plantation sites in between, on the street, as opposed to not in the pavilion, are kind of spaces to imagine, spaces of freedom. I mean, right now, right outside of Alice Yard, and that's why I chose to use downstairs, uh, groups of people that assemble here, watching the cars go by, you know, waving at people, talking, having conversation. This is a whole network to this whole community that we now function in. Um, just as the bench in Benares Street is a kind of networking bench or zone that I have seen since I was a small child, you know, but, but I noticed this new bench and it became sort of symbolic to me. So I thought it'd be interesting to take one, um, to Casa and tried to assemble one there, um, just as we took Bruce's um, sign painting there, you know? So I, I feel that it's just been misreading because you were doing Paris at one point. And what, but what I've realized now is that the form of that bench, which is an individual bench, I have my own from Trinidad in my house in yep. Toronto, it's like this tall. Um, that my mother used to use to like weed the garden with a cutlass. That yep. is also related to that other kind of bench that also you'd see in schools. Like in when I was in primary school, we sat on benches like that with the same with that same cutout triangle. Um, yeah. Oh, that's so a there is this. <laughs> yeah, I mean that, I, that same history my... of the bench. Yeah. Well, it's, it, you know, it's funny, like benches like that. I mean, the first time I used benches like that in my work, I was thinking about the original Pira and the small multi-purpose bench, you know, like to do gardening, to do little things, because I was thinking about the other globalization, I, you know, which is not the globalization of big companies shifting investment, but of individuals crossing borders um, with the skills and the imaginations that they have. Right, our conversation began with the Caribbean as a kind of place of transshipment, right? Um, and people following capital. So when I, I mean, the idea for the bench came years ago when I did a project in Holland and, um, and there was some extra cash that the curator had given to me. And I said, well, what do I, I better, I have to get this money home. And I remember the Dutch curator at the time said, oh no, we don't have things like Western Union in, in Amsterdam, are you in Rotterdam? And I was like, what? No Western Union in Rotterdam? So I went, I remember going and talking to like one of the cleaners, a brown person like myself who was cleaning in the museum. And I just said, the guy didn't speak any English, but I just said to him, Western Union, Western Union. And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like, so I had to call somebody, translate. That, and then he said, that, so I went around the corner and I remember the curator who's a friend was in disbelief. He said, you have that here? And then the two of us went there. And that was interesting. We got to this place and there was a long line of brown and all kinds of people sending money. And, and the, only, the only white person in the whole compound building was the, the curator. <laughs> and then he put his hand on his head and he said, 
wow, Chris, you know, I've lived here most of my life. I never knew places like this existed. You know, it was kind of interesting, you know, because where's the money going? All these people working, you know, they're, they're seeing about families. So I thought, so the Pira became symbolic for me as this little, you know, object of scales of imagination. So I did the one, the version with the maps and then the installation, you know, where they're on the floor and they're kind of meandering and spreading all over the planet. But this iteration um, really has to do with something. And this idea about liming and um, an assembly um, really became pivotal for me during COVID. Because in a place like Trinidad, the one thing we had to kind of sacrifice is the thing that we fought for for centuries, which is the right to assemble outside of industrial labor to make wealth elsewhere. You know, and then we all just complied for the common good or own survival. It was a species attack. We all locked up at home. But I mean, we, we fought, you know, we, we sacrificed something that we spent our whole lives, our whole, our whole history fighting for, which is the right to assemble for our own purposes, our own kind of dreams. And, 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 and um, yeah, so it was very interesting. So, um, so it's, it's not surprising that this project came about both at this time, but also within the context of our presence in Documenta, because it's something I'm trying to make sense of in my own um, sort of thinking. So you're going to, to move this bench around the castle, is that right? Well, I, I kind of thought about it um, because in other words, like the, the guys on the street here have fascinating conversations. These are two guys on the street living in the area. They come out to their houses and they sit there because they can see who's passing, what's going on. And everything is discussed here, you know, from local politics to the war in Ukraine. I'm sure if I went down there and brought up the issue around Rand Grupa, and they would wax lyrical, you know. Um, it's just that that's not, you know, an odd thing. It's not an immediate concern. But the, the, the sense of everybody is on their phones, everybody watching. They can tell you what's going on in the news. Um, you know, I mean, I think the conversation that I heard last week, uh, um, yesterday, was food prices because of the war in um, Ukraine, because the Baltic Sea is blocked and wheat, you know, and grain can't move. So they're worried about the price of flour and the supply, um, you know, and, um, but you wouldn't think that, you know, this is just, you know, uh, it's all one kind of space in which people are, you know, these things they are very aware of, you know, famine, um, you know, the, the prospects of famine, I think one person was talking about the ironies of the guy that won the Nobel Peace Prize, and now he has a war in Tigray, and you know, it's like wow, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's amazing. Um, I mean, the, the yeah. thing is, I don't know if anybody are... there wants. Uh, uh, what's this? The, the the sound is breaking up a lot. On you. I am breaking up now. Yeah, you you are breaking up a lot, so it's. It's sometimes a little hard. I could follow what you were saying. I'm not sure if you could hear. Um, but were you going to ask if anybody had a question for you? Is that it? Well, for us, yeah, we're here. Anybody has a question online or you have people in the room with you? I think Robert was here and he walked away. Um, I don't know where Nicholas went. I, I don't know if he's checking something, maybe he's sending messages or something. I don't know. Um, if anybody wanted to make a, a comment or have a question. Oh, oh, there is one from Rebecca Garrett, who is from an artist, has a question. I was wondering about the bench. Yeah. And um, the crystal images that you have in the bench, they were dragging Okay, so Rebecca, question about the bench. Can you hear me? Sure. Nod or... Yes. Okay. What is wondering whether your idea for the duration of the bench came from your being here? Whether, like, which came first? Um, well, I've been watching that bench now for about three or four years. Um, 
I'm not sure when I did that little scribble. I was looking at it for it's about three, four years. I mean, I've been watching the bench because it's been there for years. I'm, I'm not exactly sure how long it's been there, but I, I, I noticed the bench maybe about three or four years ago in the sense that that was the first time I did that little scribble in my notebook, right? And then that sort of underscored bench, you know, it's kind of the bench is going like that. When are you going to return to it? And um, at, at first I was kind of interested. I actually went on the block there and asked the guys whose idea it was to put those two elements together, you know, the office chair, whether, whether it's incidental, whether there was a kind of awareness of the symbolism, you know? And, but no, everybody was quite reticent. Nobody wanted to talk, um, you know, about that. Um, and then when I came to Casa, uh, there was a weird incident. Sean got there before me and the brew house, it was kind of weird. You know, we just come from away. We didn't have um, cell phones that were connected and it was cold. It was kind of like in November and there was no way to enter the building actually. And it's a common thing I find over the years with art spaces all over the world. I don't know when that's going to change, but art spaces do ever seem to have proper doors, you know, residency spaces. And you always seem to be outside pressing a door or somebody has to come down or you have to send a message, you know. So suddenly we arrived in Castle and, and suddenly you couldn't get in this building. And then even sometimes if you saw somebody going in and you asked them, OK, I'll go in with you. You still came to another door that was locked that you couldn't get into. But um and so we, it, we, there was a kind of moment where Sean started to get very frustrated. Like, I'm just so fed up. I'm, you know, like every time somebody says they want to meet, it's an harassment just to get in the building. And I wonder what that symbolizes. And then, and then I was thinking also just about, well, when the event comes, it's going to be, the weather will be better. And, um, and I was walking around the city and realizing, well, there are very few places for non-commercial assembly right um you know and i thought maybe um putting benches outside spaces like like carrying the bench and putting it outside a place like i mean we're still finding our feet in the situation there but i mean if we had we could get all our technology right you know like we could have chosen anywhere in the city to you could go and sit on that bench um and we could have had this conversation or we could have had two people talking on the bench somewhere, you know? So I started the bench as being mobile. It was a kind of wonderful accident when they built the bench that they added, I like the extra thing, you know, that um, Sean added a rope so it could be carried, Sean and Blue. Um, and, and I like the fact that we kind of created the bench through interaction with other working groups in Documenta as well. You know, I think they went across to the other group and they had a nice workshop, they put it together. So I like that kind of thing where different energies and different, um, and there's an original bench here sitting down in Port of Spain um, in St. James. So it's a kind of homage to something that, but on my sort of, the way in which I mentioned it on my Instagram, I talked about what we know as opposed to all we know. Um, so I'm not trying to perform this kind of um, improvisational ad hoc um, put together um, kind of innovation or invention, intuitive invention, but I'm, I'm just talking about it in the context of our own kind of experience in places like this, you know? Um, and I don't know what will happen by the time I get to Kassler if other people interact with it and so on. Yeah, but yeah, I think um, it's a combination of events. The fact that I can network it in the context of Castle, but also responding to the environment in Castle as well. Yeah. yeah. If I could yes, do a little bit of know. translation for Rebecca. I oh, a little bit of yes, translation, Rebecca. Yeah. You, you, but, but, um, so there's an original bench in this place called St. James, and I'll just contextualize St. James a little bit. It's an inner suburb of Port of Spain. And it also is one of the few urban um, urban Indian communities in Trinidad and in Port of Spain in particular. And one of Naipaul's, do you remember? One of Naipaul's books is set there with a family. In fact, the Naipaul family had a house in, in Jamie. And so it's, and it also has said, 
you know, growing up, St. James never sleeps because it's a place where you can go and find food at any time of day. So it has a particular, it has a particularity within the Port of Spain context. The benches, have you ever heard the term? I'm going to do another piece of translation. Lining? <laughs> How do you translate lining? Lining is what Trinidadians love to do, which is like hanging out. Hanging out. Basically hanging out. It's like hanging out. It could be hanging out for a whole day. <laughs> I mean, there, there's a word for it. I, I can't remember the word right now. There's a word that spelled as part of the Lombang and the terminology. I noticed Rand Grupa had a similar word. I think it's non something. N-O something. I okay. saw them use it in there. Yeah. I don't know who's been reading more fastidiously than me, but I noticed they also had a word that of sort of okay. associating and hanging out outside of traditional labor, but at the same time, yeah. Non crown. Non crown. Yeah, yeah. Sean can give a little bit of background here. Because I thought he was saying that there was one of this with the Oh, the yeah, the Pira is like, um, I have one in my house. Next time you come, you can, I can show you my own Pira from my childhood. Oh, you have one? Okay. Okay. And also, was there a discussion around how that was important? Yeah, El has a two part question. One is how did the, I guess, negotiation and the conduct go between Ron Kupra and Alice Yard? Um, and Sean, and Sean is part of that collect, right? It's, it's run by Sean is one of them. So it might be easier for Sean to respond um, than to uh, sit here. And the other one is, was the questions around Israel and Palestine at all discussed or brought up that conversation? So should I let that do it? It might be easier. Sure. <laughs> Sean will have to come closer yeah. so it can be heard. Oh. Hi, Sean. You put me on the spot again. Not so. <laughs> and then, and then, and what? Uh, so, you and Gupa and, and Alice Yard. Uh, I would say, so nine months ago, yes, uh, we were. We were we were contacted about having a conversation um, around, uh, but not really knowing with, with the two, two curators, not really knowing what the conversation was about. I think uh, a few months had passed, Chris, and then we sort of realized that, uh, that uh, these curators, were, the conversation was actually around, around the document and, uh, and possibly having a conversation around our being uh, participating. I think we had about two of those Conversations, and then uh, there was a formal notice that we would be that we would be invited to, uh, to participate. So that would have all happened, say, I'd say about eight months ago. Yeah, about eight, eight months ago. Yeah. 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 And then is that yeah, kind of. Yeah. No. How then was this? Because it's a well, I guess it's a kind of triangle in terms of uh, the Indonesian culture and writing No, you are Alice here. You are Alice here. and Chris and yeah, and there are four, four, four people. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't. No. That just came up out of the presence of the question of how it first came up. 
the objective is the inclusion of health. Okay, so, so show me to, to talk to them. Oh, and Rebecca has another question. Oh, that's great. It depends. It depends. It's another question. Okay. Okay. Okay, so Rebecca's question is, are you going to perform bench here later this summer? That's interesting because, I mean, part of the problem that with things like the bench is I am worried about performativity in the sense of kind of going native. You know, this is in the world's fair of 1880-something, right? So, um, I mean, one of the things we thought about, it, that's why I like this conversation, it's kind of informal across geographies or across, um, you know, is that the question for us is what do we talk about um, if we just on our own in a, in a meandering way without um, having to account for why we're talking to each other um, to see what comes up. And um, so, yes, I had some kind of idea um, of moving the bench around Castle as an experiment, but I'm worried about it being a kind of entertaining sort of, you know, gesture um, accommodated within the kind of um, memorandum of understanding about art gestures, you know? So, uh, you know, I'm, yes, I want to do it, but I'm nervous about the kind of a spectacle of it as, um, and I have to think those things through. As far as I'm concerned, what's most exciting at this stage of the game for me is the fact that the bench has traveled. The object, the sign has moved from one location to another. Um, in the context of this um, dialogue we're having in CASA. And, um, and then what would be the implications of it moving? Um, because I think it's so much about Caribbean experiences like that, you know, I mean, like we would like Richard has got is doing like it's funny. Richard did the thing on Dalpuri roti, and we realize it's an accident of colonial history that white flower and so on, you know. And um, like for example, since then, I just got a, a little note from Grace Ali, who is Guyanese, a curator living in the U.S. And she wants to do something. Maybe she's thinking about visiting us and cooking with curry because she thinks that curry is actually an illusion, you know, um, in terms of it, it has spurious connections to India and Indianness in a weird way in terms of, and, and how, and how, um, you know, so she wants to question that. So she's been doing some research, kind of inspired by Richard's investigations of, um, and, and in fact, I had a project that I was interested in about the fact that there's a drought in Syria that causes uh, people to move from the cities, you know, to then causes an insurrection that causes a war and a kind of social collapse. And then that has changed the street food and street cuisine in Trinidad. Now you can get shawarma with pepper sauce and pineapple. I mean, what, you know, and, uh, you know, so when people think of Trinidad now, you know, with a nostalgic, they think of doubles and roti and, and Johnny Bake. But actually, if you come to Trinidad now, it's, shawarma with pepper sauce and sold to you by venezuelans you know venezuelans are selling doubles now you know so it's it's completely chaotic the dispensation between um the 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 syrian um people coming from homs and aleppo because it seems we have a connection um historical connection and the venezuelans displaced from um Caracas. But then we've always had that relation too, you know, so that there's a kind of way so that the street cuisine and the, you know, all kinds of things are happening right around us because of the events. And in terms of my own practice, I'm becoming more and more interested in oil. And the um, oil is like the kind of, I don't know, it's like the elephant in the room in places like Trinidad. Because when you see people talk about the Caribbean, they talk about sugar. But actually, in the Anglophone Caribbean, the thing that has really shaped the last, you know, most of this, you could say the, the, the 20th century, has internet has really been things like oil, bauxite, diamonds, you know, because of Guyana, 
on Jamaica. You know, those are the things um, that have really changed. You know, tourism, yes, but, you know, sugar is a really marginal concern. And sugar was kind of subsidized by these governments to keep people employed in the countryside and to get foreign exchange. But once those agreements ended with the European Union, um, when Britain entered the European, all those relationships ended. But the recommendation for those relationships were in place since the end of the 19th century when sugar was no longer viable. Um, and sugar was no longer viable because <laughs> the labor force was <laughs> no longer available for free, you know? And so there's all kinds of weird things, you know, that nobody talks about. And um, yeah, so there we go. So, um, Sean yeah. has. Mm -hmm. Oh, how does that me a question? I just want to get a sense of because I believe I can understand you because I sort of peripheral. I'm sort of curious about your uh, your relation uh, to country of Okay, so Sean's question is other than you, is my work in conversation with other contemporary artists in Canada or, or the Caribbean? Do you, do you understand? It? He's asking what is my work, Richard yeah. work, is in conversation with other contemporary artists. So I would say that, you know, I, I, I think of my own practice as kind of weird, right? In, in some ways, like I taught in an art school. So I'm very much in conversation with other artists who are doing, you know, you go to meetings and they're painting and stuff like that. I'm really very much moving in. And so my conversation with Chris is interesting because it's based on ideas that, that on, on, a, on a medium. Um, and I have been in this for a long time with Manyan, you know, with Laird, with Tony Hall, with Paddington, and people doing moving image work. Um, and so that is my same conversation. But I also, in the Canadian context, very close friends with people like Shani Mutu, the writer. You have a question. Right? So there's a way that start city relatively small, that it's not discipline specific. I know people, you know, I know people are like Johnny Stormeyer for, for years. I don't feel myself in acknowledgeable at all about the state of contemporary art in Trinidad. Um, but for example, last year, Josh Liu, uh, who was associated with Alice Yard, moved up to do his master's at UCAT. We have been in, in a very productive conversation around his own work in my work. Because the work for his thesis at OCAD was based on his Hakka family, Chinese identity. My, fa my father's family was Hakka Chinese. And in conversation with him, I learned a lot because I realized that one of the things is that even in that tiny little community, you can't really talk about a, what the state of consciousness identity is, right? Some people very much like he's very talking about China. My father's in China and my mother's in the fourth generation. And most of the family that I grew up with was very clear of the first generation. The cousins who were who pure Chinese did not use chopsticks. They would learn to use chopsticks with my great go to Canada that they'd have to use chopsticks to go to Canada. The, the complexity of that community that community has really been brought home to me by having conversations with people. Oh, you yeah, have another question? No comment. This one that what sort of any of your Come to Yeah. So, um, 
I saw that third question, which is in relation to the two screen installation uh, animation that is in the, um, uh, the Grimm's Museum. Um, and and uh, if I had a specific response to that work. Um, I had a response to that work that was not necessarily filtered by my connection to the Caribbean, I have to say. Because for me, I mean, I only looked at it once. Um, what it was bringing up around myths is um, kind of um, the real juxtaposition of the body, you know, the swan's neck and the body with like classic, you know, the real juxtaposition. Um, it's, it's artistic vocabulary in terms of using this very fanciful drawing, very intricate drawing of the landscape mixed with appropriate images like the Cinderella dress. Um, it's very much in the language of, um, I wouldn't say global, but it's in the language of and I do I do I I I I I I I but you know what I mean? I didn't see the iconography of the Caribbean market. And I think that is the most interesting thing that people could choose to. This is a conversation we can have with Chris. No, well, I, I think, Richard, I think, Richard, I mean, you're kind of onto something. I mean, that one of the things that strikes me about that work also is how it takes on everything you say it's taking on. But if you know the, the general landscape, just Barbados as a place, not just as a site, but psychologically. I mean, that piece just disturbed the shit out of me. And all my childhood memories of navigating Barbados as a landscape came back. That's just a very small sub-story. But um, one, one of the things about, Nicholas is here because there's a question on YouTube that he wants to convey. But before I get to that, one of the things I was going to say when the question that was about what is your relationship, which is the question to you. But one of the things I think a lot about, which is where our conversations began, this particular conversation and our conversation in general, is that I'm not really sure what the real boundary of the Caribbean is, where it begins and ends. Um, because to me, the Caribbean is a kind of a critical dispensation that comes from a certain kind of historical accident or certain historical process, ways of working and ways of living through a certain history. So what I find is it doesn't make a difference whether the Caribbean is wherever Caribbean people kind of are and where they kind of embark upon this process of trying to come to terms with their journey, journey as opposed to place. So I find, um, I don't even know, like, when I talk to artists like Richard or Sandra Brewster or Nicola Y or, you know, Karen Olivia, I don't even think that they're, I think they're here. If you understand what I'm saying, the here is the, here as in, it's, it's, it's identified by a discourse, by a critical awareness coming from a certain sequence of experiences or certain journeys. And that's how I kind of define the career, not as a kind of a plot of land or a territory, you know? So I hope that's useful. I, I don't know. Um, you want to say something? I would agree with you. Can yeah. could I, could I just add to something you said before, sure. Nicholas? I think there are two things I'd like to add. One is that is true, but also I also ethically need to make a distinction between those of us who are operating and are funded in the diaspora and those who are sure. working under the conditions that exist in the region. Right? I think that is a really yeah. important dis dis distinction to make. But the other thing I also want to talk about is that there are different Caribbean. And, you know, a few years ago, there was the, what is it called? The International Gay Association, which is this huge thing of all the gay organizations. The Caribbean, there's a Caribbean panel that I went to. 
and it included people from St. Lucia, Trinidad, um, Jamaica, Belize, and Guyana, but nobody from a Francophone territory, territory, nobody from a Hispanophone territory, and nobody from the Dutch Antilles, right? So one of the things that I do is, um, is I, I've been organizing now, we, uh, the last one I did with a Haitian artist, Isri Mondesir, who I think you know, um, who I know you know, um, is these yeah. potlucks people from across the Caribbean We've done it. The last one was from Cuba to um, the Guyana, where we bring food of our of our territory and talk about it. But then the last one I actually invited, they couldn't come. I invited Jorge Lozano and uh, Alexandra Jellis, who are Colombian and Venezuelan Colombian, because they identify. In fact, that week, um, Alexandra was doing a conversation in Colombia in Spanish about El Caribe. And because I have a certain facility with French and with Spanish, I've been really interested in the overlaps and the distinctions. Like I just did a, um, a catalog essay on Kelly Sinapa Mary, the, the Guadalupian artist for the Ford Foundation new show. And it's so interested in engaging in, you know, Césaire again and Glisson and thinking about how the conversation, like when, when Glisson is writing about the Caribbean, how his Caribbean does overlap and doesn't. You know, Césaire was the one that was responsible, I didn't even know this, was responsible for um, for making Martinique and Guadeloupe a, 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 a département of France, right? They're not they're actually France, and that was his doing. That was that was his pet project. And it's so interesting too that, you know, that, that his, his master work, um, uh, you know, Return to the Native Land, was conceptualized in Croatia. Right, because he was in Croatia, kind of resting up, and he was on an island in Martinique. And so again, these global things and how they differ, how they sit next, next to each other, is something that I I am particularly fascinated by. A real Caribbean conversation, because if you're in New York and you're talking about you know in a Hispanophone context, people are just talking Puerto Rico, Cuba, you know, like Dominican Republic. They're not thinking of Trinidad. If you talk of the, the Anglophones, they're only thinking of the Anderson Caribbean. You know, the Francophones are a little bit in their own slightly anxious space because they feel a little bit, you know, we're really France and are we allowed to speak as, you know, so I think those kind of conversations are really fascinating. And sorry, Nicholas, I'll let you ask your question. And you go for it. That's okay. Well, hi, everyone. I'm just popping on here to do some basically do some admin stuff. Um, so we've, you know, we've had an audience watching on YouTube. We've had some, some commentary and, and one actual question. So I thought before we wrap up, uh, which we have to do in about the next 10 minutes, because it's getting up to 8 p.m. in Castle. But before we wrap up, I thought we should, um, we should share the question that someone left on YouTube to see if the two of you want to address it. It's from someone named P. Pfeiffer. That's the name that they've posted the question under. And here's the question. They say, um, this question might seem tangential, but do you have any... Okay. <laughs> say, say hi to the world. <laughs> okay. Let me start again. This, That's great. This, is, this is life in Belmont, right? Lots of friends. This question might seem tangential, but do you have any thoughts about found objects, for example, the bench, in relation to your research and art practice. For context, I'm thinking of everyday objects as being like nation states and their boundaries, places of origins, or individual or group identities, in that they condense assumptions about the solid or transitory nature of real lived experience, as opposed to symbolic representation. That was a long question. I'm not sure. If they made, the, the, the question part of it was your thoughts about found objects like the bench in relation to your research and art practice. It's an interesting question. Well, I, I think of Christopher's work. Go ahead, Richard. Yeah. Did Richard freeze? I'm not sure. You, you go ahead, Chris. Am I on? Go ahead, Richard. You go ahead, Richard. Well, no, I was just thinking of, you know, when Chris's work in terms of breathe brick, um, you know, um, wrought iron, 
your work is all about found, quote unquote, found. but they're not found, they're like everywhere. They're ubiquitous objects. Very ubiquitous. Um, and I'm not trying to fetishize them either. And, and I don't think in my work, I, you know, with my work, I mean, there's a funny thing going on because this is very personal. I, I say it less and less now, but years ago when I first sort of found my way with, I mean, I'm just analyzing or working with things that are around me um, that I have access to, that I feel I have some kind of connection to. And I don't know what draws me to one thing when at what time. Because sometimes I, I, I notice things and I keep them and it can be five years be before I figure out I know what it is I'm really searching for or why I'm attracted to that thing or not. Um, but the, 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 the primary reaction is personal. I mean, one of the classic examples was the Shirt Jack piece I did years ago where it was actually my Shirt Jack that I had that my parents were throwing away and I went to the house, got it, went home and was looking at it. And then all these ideas came up and it just happened to be right after the, the, in the 1990 insurrection in Trinidad. So it started to make, you know, all kinds of pieces of the puzzle. Like, why did this object come back to me at that point in time? An object from 1976 or, or, or so. And um, so with me, you know, with the bench, it's the same thing. I've been watching that bench for years. I drew it for the first time in my notebook, maybe four or five years ago. And now it's occurring. Um, but again, the, the primary goal is to, it's a personal reaction to something, trying to understand what it means to me. And then the rest is pure optimism in the sense that what would it mean to somebody else? That I have no control over. And, um, and this is why that question about performativity and liberal democracy and, the, and Europe, you know, because like, I don't, I don't want an art machinery to then take hold of that object and force it onto other people to represent or to condense or to simplify their experiences through a kind of power dynamic, you know? So I'm very nervous. I want to keep it at the personal interaction level and not kind of become something that is kind of enforced by a critical engine or an institutional engine is what I'm, which I think is implied in the question, right? It's, it's looking at the status of the object in those kinds of critical engines. Well, I think we're coming up to 8 p.m. in Castle, so I think maybe um, got like maybe about five minutes to go. So maybe now is a good time. If any last, any last parting thought questions you have for each other, I'll get out of the screen now. I'll get out of the way. But how, how, what last thoughts before we, we wrap this conversation, Chris? Right. I'll hand back to you. It's I mean, okay, thanks, Nicholas. Well, it's been a, I mean, we've been meandering. A bit. I mean, this is a lie. I mean, this is the thing I kind of wanted to say earlier, um, that um, it's moments like this that where we are not pressured. I mean, this, I mean, that's, I mean, there's something about Zoom that kind of freaks me out because Zoom, like from the time Zoom, you get on Zoom, the clock is ticking, right? You have that allotted amount of time. And then there's this pressure that you feel you have to say something significant or meaningful, or you have to be proactive within that moment. Um, so I've kind of, even though there was a little bit of a time limit on this, I kind of enjoyed just not feeling any pressure to kind of say anything too important or anything too overly relevant. Um, and I think that's kind of part of the process of what I had imagined for this encounter. Because if, 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 if nobody was around and I just happened to call Richard and say, Richard, what's going on? Um, what's happening? We might have touched on some of these same subjects, right? So the only distraction was the fact that we announced to people that we were going to have this conversation. And that uh, until it, about two hours before it started, we thought that this would be a complete closed conversation in our room. Uh, because yeah. of, of Last question from Yael. Yeah, yeah. I should just add, I understand that the bench is actually built by the Tunisian, the Moroccans, the Moroccans um, uh, here are documented. So it's again an interesting idea that it's Tunisian, it is Tunisian. I said it's a Tunisian building furniture. So it's, 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 a, it's a Trinidadian idea realized by North Africans in Germany. 
So yeah, Al wants to know, is this bench going back to Trinidad? We're going. Well, going to Trinidad. Never, but the thing is that, no, I mean, nobody wants to ship objects. I will give it to whoever wants it, but when we're leaving. It will, be, yeah, no. it will be the gift. Today I was a whole, whole yeah. thing about gift. So it will be a I, gift. I mean, any, any young person that's around, that I like it, I'll take it home. And then maybe they'll have the responsibility to use it. In fact, what I want to do is leave it ultimately with an artist um, that can use it to develop a work in conversation with me on their own when they feel like whenever. Somewhere it's really interesting in town, because when, yeah. Well, it's interesting. One of the things is like this idea of public furniture, right? And you see yeah. in like parks and things, and styles and stuff. You can maybe start a whole new set in, in Germany or Europe with this chair thing. But on that note, I think we're good to say goodbye. And hopefully, I will see you in Port of Spain in September. Well, I don't know. Today is Friday evening, so it's getting very festive out on the street, right? So, for those of you who, um, hi, Robert, hi. Um, you can see how festive it is out on the street. People are big lime starting down the road. It's been very loud and very um, exciting. <laughs> so that's what you're hearing in the background. It's Friday evening. People having so, a drink while we climb in. So, so. Chris, Chris uh -huh. again so that people here can just, you know, can you just do that again very quickly so that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, sorry. Can... Yeah. So the voices you all were hearing were outside here. Everybody's having a Friday afternoon drinking. Hi, hi. <laughs> okay. So let, let's say goodbye. Hi, folks. I'm seeing Yael. I'm not sure. I don't, I don't think I met Rebecca. That's Rebecca. I, I recognize yeah. Yael. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Bye. I still, I still have Yael's DVD. Hi, everyone. I still have Yael's DVD. <laughs> Your DVD to be a hundred years ago. Okay. <laughs> okay.